Good morning guys. I am currently on my way to my preaching class in which I'm about to preach a sermon. So I thought I'd just put this on my YouTube channel and uh, if you guys like it, make sure to let me know. If you guys are blessed by it, I'd love to hear it. Um, I am doing this for a grade in my class, however. Uh, just because it's a grade doesn't mean I'm not going to try. So if you like it, make sure to let me know. Also, I am incredibly nervous right now. I haven't been this nervous since like the last time I preached. But someone told me that that's a good thing because you're dealing with holy things. So, yeah, I feel like I'm going to throw up, so hopefully I don't. The year is 1970, and a college sophomore at the national championships, his name was Dave Waddle, and he ran a 3.59 mile, came in first place at the national college track and field championships. This was two years prior to the Summer Olympic Games. Now his time was so fast that he thought that he had a shot to go to the Olympics. So for the next two years, he relentlessly trained and trained and trained and trained. He actually trained so hard that between, in two years, he not only had one knee injury, not only two knee injuries, but he had three injuries hindering himself and hindering his goal from going to, to the Olympics. In an interview later, he said that it was so bad that even his own father started to discourage him to not try to finish his goal of going to the Olympics. But Dave Waddle did not stop. He kept going. He actually made it to the Olympics, and he made it into the qualifying final round. Mm. In the qualifying final round, he, with tendonitis in both of his knees and with a leg injury, he continued to try to meet his goal. Now, in the qualifying round, it was the day before the finals, and the way the track and field meet works is that you have, they have three heats of eight runners each. They take the top two fastest times of each heat and the next two fastest runners, total of eight runners total. Now, Dave Waddle finished first in his heat. However, out of all the winners of the heats, he, can't, he had the slowest time. It was not looking good for Dave Waddle. The next day, at the finals of the 800 meter run, half mile, twice around a, a 400 meter track, he lines up, and it was a David and Goliath story. You have, <laughs> the, you have the undefeated Russian who had not lost a race in the last three years. He had won every single race that he had ran in the last three years. Way more experienced than this young senior in college. And on top of that, he had two of the fastest Kenyans in the world up against him. And he's got tendonitis in both of his knees. You can imagine the odds that are stacked up against this guy. He's in lane three, and he lines up. And mind you that it's the Olympics. Think about how many people are there. The crowd, the atmosphere, the cheering of the crowd, the lights, the anticipation of adrenaline that must be running through his heart as he is about to run. And Dave Waddle is the only guy running with a baseball cap. On your mark, get set, bam. The whole pack goes off, and around the, hundred, around the first bend, Dave Waddle is by far the person in last place. He is so far behind that he had been behind for about 10 meters. It was almost embarrassing. Now they get to the second turn on after the first 300 meters, and he is in dead last, almost embarrassing. He is so far behind that even the commentators said that there's no way he's going to win this race, or even come close to finishing in the top three. Now, Dave Waddle, in a later interview, said that as this was happening, he thought that he would just try to catch the pack so that his loss could be somewhat respectable as he's representing the United States. He thought that because he was surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses that were around him, he had to make it through and at least make his loss somewhat respectable. As they crossed... The, for, the first lap, as they finished the first lap, he decided to move up on the pack, and he starts making great advancements with his last kick. Now, after the, with the first straightaway, he passes most of the first pack. He's now in fourth place, and the commentators are going wild. Dave Waddle moves up. He, he can't believe it. It's insane. He gets around the second bend, and he not only passes one Kenyan who's in third place, but as they get to the final stretch, he passes the second Kenyan. With, two, with 20 meters left to go, for gold medal, he passes the Russian, who is undefeated, and Dave Waddle wins the gold in the Olympic Games. <laughs> it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you have shown me a lot of great things about this text, and I become before you with a sense of excitement to open your word. I pray that you would bless my mouth. Lord, please bless those who hear this. 
uh, make me fit to speak, and just make me glorify Jesus. Pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is going to be the this is going to be the uh, the text I'm going to be preaching on. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now, a little bit of background on the book of Hebrews. The author is unknown to the state. However, it's traditionally been believed to be Paul, and that is my personal conviction. So for purposes of this sermon, I'm going to be referencing Paul as the author. However, it, the author is not directly stated within the text. However, there are four characteristics about this author that we can infer from the text. Number one, he's a very forceful speaker, very proficient in Greek, with well-crafted and complex arguments. Number two, that he has an extensive knowledge of the Torah. In fact, Hebrews is the most quoted book of the Old Testament in the entire New Testament. He quotes the Old Testament more times than any other book of the New Testament. Number three is that he's obviously a minister of the gospel. Now, his exhortation to the Hebrews is not a display of mere knowledge, but rather it's a heartfelt appeal to follow Christ every day. Mm. The fourth characteristic is that in chapter 2, he describes that he had a close personal relationship with the apostles of Jesus Christ. Now, the audience. The audience is also not specifically stated as who this was written to. However, there are three things we can infer about the audience. Number one is that they had obviously accepted Christ into their hearts, and they had made the decision to start the race of faith. Number two is that they followed Christ even in the midst of persecution. You can find this in chapter 10. And number three is that the author so greatly valued their discipleship that he had to write to them and warn them against apostasy. Now the date of Hebrews is also unknown. There's a lot of unknown about this book, but that doesn't detract about how powerful it is. Now, the book references the death of Christ, which happened in AD 31. So we can assume that it happened sometime after AD 31. However, it also does not mention a destruction of the temple in Jerusalem because the author refers to the temple as things ready to vanish away or the temple service has been abolished, that Christ's service in the heavenly sanctuary is better. So scholars infer or scholars say debate that this book was probably written between the time of A.D. 45 and A.D. 70, somewhere along that time. Now, for the literary context, if the author had a thesis statement for his book, it would be that Jesus is better. Jesus is better in every single way. Amen? Amen. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, he says that Jesus, he's better than the Torah, he's even higher than the angels. In Hebrews chapter 3, it says Jesus is better than Moses because Jesus is the Son of God. In Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus, he offers us better rest. In Hebrews chapter 5 through 10, is that Jesus is a better high priest in a better sanctuary, and his sacrifice is a better sacrifice than of the blood of goats and lambs of the Old Testament. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, who knows what Hebrews chapter 11 is about? Faith. The Hall of Faith. That's right. The Hall of Faith is Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 12, this is, this is Paul's exhortation to hold fast in the faith which they have started. And Hebrews 13 is his conclusion. He gives counsel, benediction, and final words. Now, let's get into the text. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2 together. Starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Amen. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Mm. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'm just going to move through this verse. In chapter one, in chapter twelve, verse one, it says, "Therefore we also." He gives an emphatic "therefore," and also "we also." Meaning, this text is obviously in reference to chapter 11. So everything that Paul had said in chapter 11, this is his final conclusion of chapter 11. It's his great call to finish the race of faith. Now, he not only says, in the context of this, he says that the Christian walk is like a race. It's like an endurance race. Now, 
In Hebrews chapter 11, he goes over all of those who have finished the race of faith. Great examples for us to follow. But because he says we also and therefore, he's not only saying that we are a part of this race, but he says that we are the culmination of everything that has gone before us. Because he says that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that word cloud is nephos in the Greek, and it, means, it literally means a great, unnumerable throng of vast multitudes. He says because of this reason, we are to lay aside every weight that so easily ensnares us and run with endurance. Now, he goes over in Hebrews chapter 11. There's some people who started the race bad, but it's not about how you finish. It's not about how you start, but it's about how you finish. Mm. Let's look at Moses. Moses, he had a bad start. He murdered someone. Then he fled to the desert for 40 years. But God still called him to deliver the Israelites from the hand of Pharaoh. It's not about how you start, but it's how you finish. Rahab. Rahab. Paul mentions Rahab in chapter 11. Now she started off as a prostitute. But because of her faith, she allowed Joshua and the spies to get away. And she is mentioned in the Hall of Faith. It's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. Now let's look at Samson. Even Samson is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Wow. <laughs> Even Samson. Paul says, he says that all, in verse 39, all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. He refers to even Samson obtained a good testimony. Even Samson had a good testimony in the <laughs> eyes of Paul. Samson, he had a rough life, but he finished well. He finished with faith in God and accomplishing what could have been a greater mission. Mm. Lastly, look at David. David had a great start. He had a great start being called by God, king of Israel, defeating Goliath, outrunning the person who was trying to kill him. However, he didn't really end too well, did he? Mm. And because of that, David's legacy was a little bit tainted. We have great things to remember him by. <laughs> However, when we think of David, we always think about him having adultery with Bathsheba and murdering her husband. It's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. In the light of all this, let's read 39 and 40. He says, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for who? What does the text say? Verse 40. God having provided something better for us. us, the readers of Hebrews, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. They will receive the fulfillment of God's promise the same time we do. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, because of this reason, because we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Dave Waddle, when he was running, when he was in last place, he thought that if he finished so far behind, he would be an embarrassment to the United States. Mm. So because he was surrounded by so many people on national television, the entire world was watching him, because he was surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he decided that he was going to try and just move up a little bit. Little did he know that he would actually win the race. So for this reason, because you and I are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we have the witness of Moses, Rahab, Samson, David, Elijah, all looking to us to finish the race of faith. Oh, for this reason, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Oh. For this reason, you and I have to lay aside not only the sin which ensnares us, but the weight now, I have an illustration about laying aside some weight. All right, so I got this big backpack here. Good. All right. So now, not, not only that. All right, Jacob, I want you, you feel like you're running a half mile now? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no? All right, I want you just to start running this race. All right, so Paul says that we should lay aside the weight and sin that so easily ensnares us. This, this would be impossible for him to run a half mile in. But Paul says to lay aside his weight. So let's have Jacob lay aside the weight. Now, what's interesting is that this verb, to lay aside, 
in the Greek, it's in the aorist form, meaning that it's only supposed to happen one time in the past. You lay aside your sins <laughs> once, and then you run the race. Amen. However, what do we as Christians sometimes do? We go back, we turn around, and we pick up the weight that we had already left off. Mm. Yeah. Now, Jacob, continue to run this race. <laughs> How ridiculous would this be for you to lay aside the things that so easily hinder you and for you to pick it back up and continue to try to run this race? It's absurdity. But Paul says to lay it aside one time and move forward. Amen. In Erdman's Bible Commentary, the Expositor's Bible Commentary, I found this quote very interesting. He says, Such a race run in a very public arena requires not, not only maximum concentration, but also the removal of all that could reduce performance. It says, Pictured in the terms of athletic, an athletic metaphor, weights or an excess bodily weight or the entangling sin the author coins a graphic term, things that easily ensnare, picturing something perhaps a flowing garment that clings around the runner's leg. Now, this is super interesting as I was researching this, because get this, in 776 BC, the first Olympic festival honoring the Greek god Zeus happened, and it turned in and eventually involved in what we know today as the Olympics. However, in 720 BC, one of the Olympic victors, his name was Orsippus of Megara. In the middle of his race, he tore away his loincloth so that he could run unhindered and finish the race. Mm. This commentator says that this story was so well known in the Greco-Roman world that Paul could have been referencing this exact story. Mm. So Paul is saying, that if Olympic runners are willing to run naked to the point where they are running so unimpeded, how much more should we as Christians mm. lay aside the things that easily ensnare us? Amen. 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 It's not only that. You can't lay aside your sin on your own. Mm. You've got to look at Jesus. Mm. Yeah. You've got to look at Jesus. He is the only one that gives us true rest. Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus offers us a better rest. He says, take my yoke upon you, for it's easy and my burden, it's light, compared to the sin that weighs you down. Mm. <clears throat> Amen. It says, let's look at verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God. Now you may look at me and say, Nick, it's hard to lay a crop. It's hard to lay down my sins. In fact, this sounds like a lot of loss. This sounds like a lot of loss. It means there's some friends that I can't really be around as much. There's some, there's some movies that I just have to give up. There's certain languages that I can't, certain words that I can't say now as a Christian, certain activities that I can't do. It sounds like a lot of loss. Paul knew this. That's why he says, that's why you look at Jesus. Amen. Because it was a lot of loss for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. He says, you know what? It's loss for me. This is, I will never sleep again until I die. Mm. He despised the shame. Now, that can kind of be a confusing phrase. So let me clarify. To despise, according to the dictionary, means to feel contempt and a deep repugnance for something. And shame is a painful feeling of humiliation. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, when he was thinking about the shame that he would feel, the deep humiliation, when he thought of that, because of his joy, he despised it and said, you know what, it's worth it for mm -hmm. me to die on the cross. Amen. It's worth it for me to, to die on the cross. There's a lot of loss for Jesus to hang there and be humiliated like a criminal. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of loss. That's what Paul said. You're right. Sometimes it is. You will have to lose things. Mm. However, in the context of this race, it will help you run. That's right. It is a benefit for you to lay down the things that hold you back. 
It is your benefit. It is your every advantage to lay down the things that so easily ensnare us. The weight and the sin. It's not only the sin, the things that, that separate us from God, but it's also the weight that holds us down. When you're thinking of things to lay down, don't only think of the sin that you have to lay down, because that's silly. If you only lay down the sin, that's basically just unchaining yourself while still holding the backpack and running. He says lay down the weight as well. Things that may not be a sin, but are they helping you run? I struggle with this. Sometimes all I want to do is watch four hours of Netflix at once. <laughs> Is that good for me? No, it's not good for me. But is that holding me down? Yes, that probably holds me down. Mm -hmm. Over Christmas break, the only thing I did was I watched eight seasons of Netflix because I had nothing to do. <laughs> yes, I know. But just being honest, that's something that I personally struggle with. However, am I, I feel like God has blessed me where now he's given me the strength for now if I feel like I want to watch something, I just watch something that's going to be a little more edifying. I watch a sermon. I watch It Is Written. Something. Amen. Just to edify me. Amen. No, he, no, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And he also says that we are to run this race with endurance. Mm. Sometimes, there's many times in this walk where you just don't feel like, gotta keep going. Mm. You want to just just lay down and just lay down in the middle of the track and say, you know, I'm done. I can't walk. <laughs> can't walk anymore. I have no desire to finish this race because who here has ran like a marathon, like a 5K, or some sort of race? Okay, so in the middle of the race, what starts to happen? Cramps. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you get cramps. You want to throw up. You say, I want to throw in the towel. You say, I'm tired. I'm going home. Right. <laughs> Everybody experiences this in their Christian walk. And if you're experiencing it, you're, you're not weird. In fact, you're normal because everybody experiences it. Mm. So how do you keep going? Paul says you're to run with endurance looking at Jesus. Mm. It's not about how you start, but it's about how you finish. Amen. You look at Jesus. Now, Jesus is in heaven. I can't physically see him. So how do I look at Jesus? Through faith. Through faith. Look at Jesus through faith. Mm. You gotta look at Jesus through faith. There are times when you don't feel like keep going. And a great example of someone who had great faith and who obtained a good testimony and was carried away to heaven in a chariot of fire was Elijah. Mm -hmm. Elijah had a Mount Carmel experience. On top of Mount Carmel, he sees fire coming down from God. The whole nation of Israel acknowledges that Yahweh is God and not Baal. That's right. What was the very next thing that Elijah did? Coward. He cowered <laughs> and he ran. And he ran, and he ran, and he ran. And he became so far from God that he wanted to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. He did not want to keep going. I've had a few experiences like this. How, how about you? Mm -hmm. But what's kept me alive is that prayer is the breath of the soul. Amen. Amen. You can go a little while without eating or reading the word, but if you're not breathing, how long can you go without breath? You can be hungry for some time, but can you really breathe for some time? Mm -mm. There's been times where I felt like quitting and giving up my walk with Christ and just going back because it simply would be easier. However, what kept me going was my constant communication with God. It didn't have to be very long. Sometimes I'd just be in the shower and say, God, please help me. I'm a sinner. Amen. Mm. There'd be times when I would feel like giving up and say, God, you got to help me. Please, I can't do this any longer. And every time, God has sustained me. Amen. He is not only the author who began your faith, but he will see you through. You will finish the race because he is the finisher of your walk. Mm. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, seeing you in heaven, he went ahead and died for you on the cross. Mm. Who for the joy that sat, with the joy that was before him, he saw you and said, I can't, I can't be there without him. I can't be there without her. They have to be there with me. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. Matthew chapter 28. He says, all power and authority has been given to me under heaven. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, because he truly does exist, he gives you power. That's right. You can finish the race. It's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. 
if I could leave one thing with you guys today, is that there are things in all of our lives that hinder us from running the race. That process of giving things up, that process of watching Jacob throw off the backpack, that's the process of sanctification. Mm. That happens over a process of your entire life. Amen. That's the process. That's the process. It's a process. you got to trust the process. When you are running the race, there's one thing that Paul says you're to do above all else, is look at Jesus. Because when you look at Jesus, you have the best example you can ever follow. You have the best friend you could ever have. You have the best God who exists. It's not about how you start. It's about how you finish.